page, the characters. You've got to know the characters before we read the book. How far did we get on Jesus and the Jewish sects? Did we do that, Paige? Yeah, I think so. I think we're ready to start three. All right. Let me just, say, just recapitulate that when you read the Gospels, it looks like Jesus against the Pharisees. That's a very, very misleading. When the Gospels were written at the end of the first century, the Pharisees were the only Jewish group around. Thank you. The Nazarenes, the, the Christians, two Jewish groups. And so they were fighting for the title of Israel and didn't like each other at all. So the Gospels reflect hostility to the Pharisees. But as I pointed out, there were seven different branches of Pharisees and some very liberal, like Jesus, who stressed the ethical but not the ritual, and some very reactionary, and those he keeps bumping into, the Southern Baptist Pharisees. And, but he may keep talking to them because he, in fact, is a Pharisee. All Pharisee means is a commentator trying to apply the rules of the Bible to the daily life of the average Jew which is what Jesus was trying to do and what the Pharisees did. The difference between him and the Pharisees he generally fights with, they're always fighting either, either bad company or the ritual side of the law. Remember, the Jewish law has two aspects, the ethical law, and if anything, Jesus was stricter on that, even if you look at a woman with adultery in your heart. The Pharisees said, you can, you can look, but just don't do it. He said, you can't even look. So he was stricter morally than they, but on ritual law, kosher laws, Sabbath laws, he was very lax. And that's what they argued over. All right, the particular Pharisees he had to run, run-ins with. Michael? Yes. I asked you as we were leaving last week if you could elaborate a little on this messianic secret. Yes, I will. Okay. And then Jesus and the Sadducees, nothing in common. They ran the temple. They were hereditary priests, and they believed that if you stopped offering animal sacrifice, the world would end. He, he attacked the temple system in the last week of his life and gained the enmity of the high priest, who probably never heard of him before that, but the last week. If, in fact, Mark is right, that Jesus wasn't in Jerusalem to the last week of his life. Now, if you read John, who is very inaccurate historically, he may have stumbled on something accurate, that Jesus was in Jerusalem for visits throughout his life, his three-year career. It may be, uh, but in any case, the high priest would only care about what Jesus did in the temple courtyard, because that was the focus of Sadducee religion. Not the daily life of people at all, but just the sacrificial system. So their religion was very narrow, focused on one place and one elaborate ritual. And the Essenes, well, he was celibate, and he, didn't, he thought property, any property, was a distraction from God. He thought marriage was a distraction from God, apparently, because he didn't marry. He asked his disciples to leave their property and to leave their children and their wives and follow him. Did he believe the world was going to end right away? Family, especially the Jews who were so family-oriented. So it was shocking to people that he would say that. But he may have said it because he expected the imminent end of the world. He said, this generation will not pass away until the Son of Man comes in glory. Well, it didn't happen. Instead of having Christ returning, we got the church, and which awaits his eventual return. But he and Paul and the early church expected the return to be immediate. So in, under those circumstances, you might reject your family. In any case, cel celibacy and poverty the only celibate pop, uh, group of monks in the history, 4,000 year history of the Jews, were the Essenes. So did he have some connection with them? Was he an Essene minister, a missionary, who went out and collected 12 young men to come back to the Essene monastery? Because they didn't reproduce, they didn't have sex, so they had to continually get new blood. Possible, I don't think likely, but it's possible. And he was on the way back to the Dead Sea to the monastery when he stopped in Jerusalem for Passover and Pontius Pilate caught him. Now, the messianic secret. In Mark, when people come up to Jesus 
and say, good teacher, he says, don't call me good, only God is good. Now the man who said that didn't think he was co coextensive with God. Mark's Jesus is not God. John's Jesus, 30 years later or more, has morphed into a divine being. But Mark's Jesus is not. People call him Messiah and he says, be quiet about that. And he calls himself the son of man. So whatever that means, we'll have to analyze that. It's complicated. But the messianic secret is that when anyone proclaims he's the Messiah or he, he, he cures someone and they're going to want to run and say, Jesus cured me, he must be a magical man with divine powers, he says, don't tell anyone. So there's a constant secret. Now that messianic secret may mean he thought he was the Messiah, but didn't want the Romans to figure it out and kill him before he was ready to go to his death. Or maybe he didn't think he was the Messiah. It's very hard to know what was going on in Jesus' head. He never comes into a town, ever, and says, here I am, I'm the Messiah, what do you think of that? He comes in and he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. And we'll analyze what he might mean by that. That's the essence of Jesus' preaching the kingdom of God. Only at the very end, when the high priest questions him, in one version, they say, are you or are you not the Messiah, the Son of God? And one answer is yes. The other says, the other gospels say, you say that I am. So even then, he sidesteps it. There's a secret here. Now, the, the Essenes had secret doctrines. And when you join the Essenes as a novice, you gradually over the years learn the secret doctrines that only they learned. So I'm suggesting that may be a, a third thing he had in common with the Essenes. But it's, it's very difficult to know. Was he an independent holy man, preacher, teacher, and healer? Most likely. Was he a very liberal Pharisee? Possibly. Was he an Essene mi missionary and that's where he was for the 30 years of his life? With the Essenes? Possibly. So we're just not sure. Many different theories, many different books. More books have been written on the Christian religion and its doctrines than any other topic in history. Second, the Civil War. Civil War. Yep, War between the states. Historical Jesus, page three. This is what we know about Jesus. Because Mark doesn't have a Christmas story, a virgin birth. And some people say these are elaborations, miraculous elaborations. A great man comes and presents himself to the world, and over the years, miracle stories grow up about him. Moses and the bulrushes and all this. Moses leads the Israelites out of Egypt, we know that, but all those childhood stories, birth narratives and childhood narratives, grow up about the great savior figures. So that the virgin birth story and the wise men and all that, that's not in Mark. That, was con that, was, that grew as part of the story in Matthew and Luke. And John doesn't have it either. Because for John, Christ is a cosmic being who comes down from heaven. It doesn't matter when he was born or where. But for Matthew and Luke, we have those wonderful Christmas details. But Mark starts the story with Jesus' baptism. And that's historical. At the age of 30, he started a, by John the Baptist, and his early missionary, his early journey, his early teachings were closely connected to John the Baptist. Some people thought when John was beheaded by wicked Herod that Jesus was John the Baptist rid of Evas, come back from the dead. Because John the Baptist, in one gospel, he says the kingdom of God is at hand. And in another gospel, Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. Exactly the same message. There are people in the Middle East today who believe John the Baptist was the Messiah. They're called Mandeans. They live in Iraq and they are persecuted. But in those days, the early Christian religion was a rival to the Mandeans, as it was a rival to traditional Judaism. It was a radical branch of Judaism, which eventually broke off. But in the beginning of the Gospel of John, why does it say a whole thing about John? A man came from God. He was not the Messiah, but he was the forerunner of the Messiah. Now get it straight, folks, reader, he wasn't the Messiah. 
You might think he was the Messiah, but he wasn't. Why is this whole argument? We know today he wasn't the Messiah, but the Mandeans were a big movement in those days, and they thought John the Baptist was the Messiah. So the preface to the Gospel of John is an argument against them. You might wonder, why are they arguing this at John the Baptist? We know he wasn't the Messiah. In those days, they didn't. There were people who thought he was, and there's still people who think it. In any case, he was baptized by John the Baptist. For what? For the remission of sin. John the Baptist announced the kingdom of God is at hand. The world is about to end. And everyone has to be washed of sin. And the symbolic washing of the body is the implied inner washing of the soul. And Jesus shows up for that. Now I'll give you my theory of why he did. I'm not sure it had anything to do with sin. But we'll get to that next week. So he's baptized. He assembles a, a collection of followers. We call them the disciples. They're his 12 students. And for three years, he went around the country. And often those guys were society's outcasts. And the respectable rabbis, the Pharisees, said, why, Rabbi, why are you hanging out with those terrible people? But Jesus said, the sick need a physician, not the healthy. Enoch Freud was the first one to use a medical model to talk about immorality. It's a sickness. He was very popular among the Jewish people. Now, you have to remember, the great lie of history is the Jews killed Christ. The second greatest lie is the Jews rejected Jesus. The Romans killed Jesus, and Pontius Pilate was not the namby-pamby the Gospels make him out to be. He was a murderous thug, and he's so cruel, the Romans withdrew him as governor of Judea. He probably crucified 10,000 people in his day, Jesus among them. The second lie, the Jews rejected Jesus. The Jews, when Jesus asked Peter, who do my fellow Jews say I am? He said, they think you're a prophet. That's not to reject him, that's the highest compliment they knew. But it, what, what the Jews rejected in the late first and early second century was the idea that Jesus was God. Because their idea of God as Ramvani so high and lifted up, the exalted God on this throne in heaven, is so transcendent that the idea of God becoming man is unthinkable. Although he does appear in human form in the, in the book of Genesis. But that's a temporary appearance not born, lived, died as a man. That's an addition of Christian theology. And mainstream Judaism wouldn't accept that. But as far as Jesus being a prophet, there's no reason why. The only reason the Jews today don't include him as a prophet is because they pulled away when people began saying Jesus was divine. The high Christology of the, of the church. All right. He was popular with the Jewish people. We know that because on Monday and Tuesday of Holy Week, the high priest wanted to arrest him when he attacked the temple system and preached against the Sadducees and their temple. But he couldn't because of the people. That's why they had to try him in the Antonia Fortress, where they literally gave out tickets. The Roman governor and the high priest wanted Jesus dead, but they didn't want to be blamed for it because of his popularity. So... They went to a, an enclosed fortress, a Roman fortress, and there they probably literally gave out tickets. And Mel, Mel Gibson, is that his name in that peculiar movie of his? He says they gave out tickets, as I remember. And so the crowd, stubborn, stubborn, the crowd was handpicked by the high priest and Pontius Pilate and they said, well, what do you want us to do with Jesus? And they yelled, crucify him. But they were, there, they were scripted to say that. And they weren't a, a cross-section of the population of Jerusalem. All my life I've heard sermons. How could the people of Jerusalem greet him on Palm Sunday, Hosanna to the son of David, and on Friday want to kill him? Nothing had happened to make them change. Well, first of all, the people who greeted him in Jerusalem were not the people of Jerusalem who had never heard of him. He was a, a northern prophet. And they, he brought his own people. And if you read Mark carefully, the people he brought with him spread the palms and declared him the king. And then on Friday, it wasn't a cross-section of Jerusalemites either. It was the flunkies of the high priest and the Roman governor who screamed out on cue, and they thought, oh, now I'm free of guilt. But they were responsible, two men. 
one, ma one Italian and one Jew, and yet the Jews have been blamed for all this down through the ages. Why not the Italians? We shouldn't be eating spaghetti. Is it the, point, is it the problem of all Italians because Pontius Pilate was Italian? How ridiculous. And it's not the responsibility of every Jew because the high priest was Jewish. All right. He was popular with the people. He was opposed by the more reactionary elements of the Pharisees. He had friends among the Pharisees. In Luke, they warn him when the Romans are coming and he gets out of town. It was the reactionary Pharisees who fought with him over issues of ritual law, not ethical law. The Sadducees fought with him during the last week over the temple when he attacked the temple. They, neither group liked the bad company he kept because they had to worry about the purity of the Jewish people. He didn't. He always went after the individual soul and had a different take on it. And the Romans, of course, ultimately killed him because they thought when he talks about a kingdom that he wanted to throw out the Roman governor, overthrow Caesar's power in Palestine, and become the king of the Jews. And that crucifixion was a punishment for political agitation and sedition, and over the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. That was why he was executed. That's why they crucified people. What was his teaching? The kingdom of God is at hand. That was the essence of the teaching of Jesus Christ. These four quotes are agreed on by many, many scholars to be actual quotes of Jesus. Because scholars do not accept it just because it says in the Gospels, he said this and he said that, that he said it. They weren't written till a generation after Jesus died and you have the gospel writers saying what they think he said. But it's hearsay over the last 40, 50 years. Now when John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the good news as if to continue John's mission. And saying the kingdom is, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent in this good news. Jesus certainly said that. Now it looks like he means the apocalyptic kingdom. Now, now, now let me now talk about three kinds of eschatology. I should have written it out in the sheet, but I didn't have time. Eschatology means the study of the last things. Christology, the study of who Christ was. Soteriology, the study of, of salvation. And uh, other ologies. But eschatology is concerned with the ultimate or the last things. There are three kinds of eschatology, according to Rudolf Bultmann, the great Christian theologian. One is historic eschatology. This historical age is about to end and a new history will be begun. The world will look like and the Messiah will come to usher it in. God will send his agent to do it, or God will intervene personally in history. What will the new age look like? Just like this, same earth, same heaven, but there'll be no immorality, there'll be no racism, there'll be no war, there'll be no cruelty. It'll be a morally perfected historical age. That's historical eschatology, ushered in either by God directly or the Messiah. Second, apocalyptic eschatology. This world is going to end with fire and flood and planets smashing into each other, the moon shedding blood, the stars falling from the sky, apocalypse, the end of the world. And lo, I make all things new, a new heaven and a new earth will descend and will live in a totally different dimension, somehow beyond time and space. That's apocalyptic eschatology, and you have it in Daniel, he invented it, then you have it in the book of Revelation, in, and the book of Zechariah, these technicolor dreamlike visions of angels and chariots and, and God sweeping across the sky, wonderful stuff. The imagination of man has been released by such speculations. So that's apocalyptic eschatology. Now the question is, what does Jesus mean? Because the kingdom of God in historic eschatology means a new age of history, perfected age. The kingdom of God in apocalyptic eschatology means a new heaven and a new earth, a totally new world, and an end of this one 
in destruction, and then you will see the Son of Man coming in clouds of glory. That's apocalyptic eschatology. Did he mean that? Or does it mean realized eschatology? Realized eschatology is the third kind of eschatology. The kingdom of God is right here now in the religious community. You join the church, you get involved in it, and you're in the kingdom of God. Who is king in this room, in this building? God. And we as members of this church or members of another church or of a synagogue are the subjects of the divine king. To be an Israelite, a Christian Israelite or a Jewish Israelite, is to be a member of the kingdom of Israel. God is our king. Now, that's realized eschatology. So that's a third kind. I think Jesus believed in a combination of the second and the third. Yes, he believed. When you joined his movement, you were entering the kingdom of God now. Yes, he believed that when he could cast out demons and cure sick people and even raise the dead, which he does in John, that means the kingdom of God has broken into time now. Kingdom present. But in this first kingdom of God saying, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe, I think that's apocalyptic. That the world's about to end, you better get shed of your sins. Now Jesus never baptized anyone in the Synoptic Gospels. In John, he does. But John is not historically accurate. It's beautiful, but that's very late gospel. Why didn't Jesus baptize anyone? Because baptism is a virtual birth ceremony. By baptism, you enter the people Israel. Not John's baptism. That was for repentance of sin. Now, Jesus called people to repent sin, but, of sin, but he never baptized them. He, he didn't think that was necessary. If baptiz so baptism, you know, has two meanings. When they baptize people at this font here, they say you're now marked as Christ's own. You've joined the church. But it also wipes away your sin. So the reason I think Jesus didn't baptize people was because he preached, according to Matthew, only to Jews. To Mark, there were a few, gen except, there were two, two exceptions, the Syrophoenician woman and the Gerasene demoniac. Otherwise, they were all Jews. And when the woman comes up to him, he says, I can't help your daughter because you're not Jewish. And she convinces him and he does it, but he's reluctant, yes. The Essenes constantly had immersions in water. And Jews have immersions in water after any flow of seminal fluid, after the woman's period, and before marriage, you immerse yourself in water. Men too. Yes, sir. Well, there are people who, who go to, there are people who go to the ritual bath before Yom Kippur. But Yom Kippur is a later development, well, actually, probably after the Babylonian exile. It may have been already in place by Jesus' time. It probably was. But yes, that is a verbal getting rid of sin. Yes, more abstract. But Judaism is a more abstract religion than Christianity. We do have immersions every once in a while. But in order to join the Jewish people, you do, if you're a convert, you have to be immersed in water. Yes, you are, you are reborn into the in people Israel. So to be baptized is to be reborn. You can't be born a Christian. People say, I was born a Catholic, now I'm a Protestant. You, no, they weren't born anything. They were baptized, reborn a Catholic. In Judaism, you are a Jew if your mother is Jewish. But if, you're, if you don't have a Jewish, if your mother is Jewish, when you come out of the womb, all those fluids that come with you, that's your baptism. But if you didn't have that experience and are a convert to Judaism, you have to have a virtual birth ceremony and they dunk you in the ritual bath and declare you to be Jewish. So Jesus didn't have to baptize if he preached only to Jews because they already were born of Jewish mothers and they were part of the people Israel. Why would Jesus baptize? 
Because that's a good question, I'll get to that. I don't think it had anything to do with John's baptism for the remission of sin. I believe, well, I'll tell you now. After he's baptized, you hear a voice from heaven. In Mark, only he hears it. In Matthew, everyone hears it. This is my son, today I've begotten you. That's the second psalm, which was the coronation anthem of the kings of Israel, who were believed by the Jews to be the adopted sons of God. Every ancient people either believed their kings were gods, in Egypt, Pharaoh was a god, or in Mesopotamia, an adopted son of God. The Jews, having Abraham having come from Mesopotamia, followed the Mesopotamians and they said that their kings were the anointed adopted sons of God. So the choir sings at the time of the anointing of the king of Israel with sacred oil by the high priest, thou art my son, this day I have I've begotten thee. The, the heavenly choir sings it in Jesus' case, when John the Baptist pours the water on his head, thou art my son. So I think he was baptized by John the Baptist to tell the reader, this is the true king of Israel. Does it mean the king of the old Israel, the Jews? Or does it mean the king of the new Israel, the church? Or does it mean both? Well, Mark doesn't have the word church in his gospel. He doesn't have a concept of church at all. That's born with Matthew. But certainly the Christian movement was, could be a new Israel. So I think that's why Jesus was baptized, to declare his kingship. He is a son of David. Uh, he, might, he might also have been making common cause with humanity, trying to wash away sin. Of course, Christian orthodoxy would say he's not, he couldn't commit sins, he's sinless. But that's not clear in Mark at all, because remember, the woman says, good teacher. He says, don't call me good, only God is good. So the doctrine that Jesus was without sin is a later doctrine. Uh, in Mark, you have a very, very human Jesus. I hope that answers the question. All right. Second quote. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. That sounds like realized eschatology. And Luke is very big on realized eschatology. The kingdom is right here in the power with which I cast out demons and cure the sick. Third, quote three. The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. That seems to be a denial of apocalyptic eschatology, which had all kinds of supernatural signs. Nor will you say, lo, here it is or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Now, which would that be? Which kind of eschatology? Realized. Luke believes in realized eschatology. Did Jesus see the big problem of New Testament scholarship that never comes up in church. In church, you just assume Jesus, it's written here, Jesus said it, that's it. But the scholars realize that between Jesus' death in 30 or 33 AD and Mark's writing the gospel in 71 AD, the first gospel, all those years passed. What we have are the words of Jesus and the life of Jesus according to four writers. Are these authentic words of Jesus or not? It's very hard to say, because Luke stresses uh, uh, realized eschatology. Mark has apocalyptic eschatology. Did Jesus believe in both? Which did he say? The kingdom of God is already here, or it's about to break on us? That there will be signs or there won't be signs? Could he have said both? He seems to be contradicting himself. Well, the gospels do contradict themselves between kinds of eschatology, but did Jesus too? I don't know, he had three years in order to say a lot of things. Maybe he developed theories as he went along. I don't know. Yes? This is a problem with the Old Testament too. Absolutely, same thing. Moses is given all kinds of credit for things that Ezra really did. The five books of Moses, so-called, were compiled by Ezra. Not in 1290 BC when Moses lived, but in uh, about 428 BC. Now, the materials go back long before Moses. Oral transmission and snippets of material done by four schools of writers over 500 years. But it was Ezra who compi compiled, compiled the whole thing into the five books of Moses. Moses gets credit. Yes, ma'am. So, is Mark then um, apocalyptic? Mark believes in apocalyptic eschatology. We know that because he, puts, he has a, Jesus say, what we call the apocalyptic discourse at the end of his life. 
in which he gives a classic description of, of, of the stars falling and the sun going out and all kinds of things and mountains falling into the sea and chaos. So Mark believes in apocalyptic eschatology. Luke stresses realized eschatology. But what did Jesus say? Neither, both, one or the other, we can't know because we don't know what was going on during those years of oral transmission between his death and the time Mark took his pen up to write. But didn't Jesus' death present a problem to those who believed in realized eschatology? That, you know, that well, no, now the church took his, remember, the church took his place and the church is the place of realized eschatology, the Christian community. It's here right now. We're living in realized eschatology. When I go to synagogue as a Jew, I'm in the kingdom of God, and God is my king, and I'm praying and praising him. When I come here on Sunday morning, because I go to both, then I'm in the kingdom of God, Christian branch. But I'm, I'm thinking that the, that the followers of Jesus, at the time, you know, his death created a problem. It, yes, they did, but they immediately solved it by saying it was a redemptive death, and it was the beginning of the story, not the end, and they made it real. They made a virtue of necessity, which is a classic Jewish thing to do. When you're scattered all over the world and driven from your country, you say, ah, it really was good because God seeded the whole world with Jews who are moral witnesses wherever they go. So you make a virtue of necessity. Jesus is killed to the surprise of his followers, but they figure it out, and they figure it out quickly. He died for our sins, and... He will be raised again, so he's not really dead. He's gone to his father, and he'll come back, and he sent the Holy Spirit to guide the church, and here is the kingdom of God. And of course, both work. The Jews and Christians are still here. Very smart people. I, they could have given up. When the Jews were exiled from Palestine, they could have said, well, our God has deserted us. We'll join the Babylonian religion. The followers of Jesus could have said, God has deserted him and us, so we'll go back to mainstream Judaism, but they didn't. And they both held out and they both won. Four, from the days, so three denies apocalyptic eschatology and says it's right here, realized. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and men of violence plunder it, realized. It's here now and was here from John the Baptist's witness. All right. So, the, they don't agree on the eschatology that Jesus taught. So when we say the essence of his teaching was the kingdom of God is at hand, that leads to the question, what did he mean by kingdom of God? And we've got to look at each time he says it and try to figure from the context, as we did with these four quotes, there are many others, what it means, what he had in mind, trying to get into the inner life of Jesus, of course. Who can presume to do that? but we're trying to figure out how he viewed himself, not with a great deal of success. The Synoptic Gospels. I mean, people are always saying, conservative Christians, do you believe Jesus was who he said he was? And if he wasn't, he was a lunatic. So we have to believe. But the, my question, and the question of scholars is, whom did he say he was? If I am the Messiah was not part of his preaching from town to town, but the kingdom of God was this preaching, and when people focused on him, a woman runs up to him and says, I'll follow you anywhere you go. And he says, birds have, or man does, uh, runs up to him, birds have nests and foxes have holes, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. You're going to follow me? And somebody else says, blessed is the womb. A woman comes up, blessed is the womb that bore you. And he immediately turns her away from focusing on him to his message. No, blessed are those, he says, who follow my teachings. He focused on his teachings, but the medium over the years has become the message. Now the church focuses on Jesus. The church's question is, what do you think of the Christ? That was not Jesus' question. That was the church's question. After he left, he became the focus, not his message, but his person. And that's a difference. In his time, it was the message. The Synoptic Gospels, page 4. The Gospel of Mark. It's the first gospel. We'll read it in detail this summer. Did the author know Jesus? Maybe only during the last week of his life, though. 
He was a teenager. He may have been the young man who, when Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane, as my, one of my students said, Yosemite, a little mixed up. Uh, they said, uh, this girl said, after the Last Supper, Jesus went to pray in the Garden of Yosemite. And I wrote, that's quite a trip even for him. But, but she also said that Jesus Christ was crucified between two train robbers, trains in first century Palestine. So I wrote in the margin, wrong, they were airplane hijackers. Invincible ignorance. In any case, I'm not teaching 18-year-olds anymore. So who was Mark? We think he was the young man whose tunic was torn off by one of the guards who arrested Jesus in Gethsemane, and he ran naked into the night. That's only in Mark, that little description. That may be his signature on his own book, the way an artist puts his signature. We believe the early Christian movement met in Mark's mother's house in Jerusalem in the early months of the movement. Mark may have been Peter's assistant at some point. He was not one of the twelve. He was not important until he wrote the gospel, and thank God he did, because Paul had already written in the 50s AD, but Paul was totally uninterested in Jesus' life, Jesus' sayings, Jesus' miracles. He was only interested in Jesus' death and resurrection, and what the blood shed on the cross accomplished. That's Paul's theory. It was shed to gain forgiveness of our sins. He died in our place. Mark picks that up, and Matthew picks that up. Luke does not, and John does not. Luke says Jesus died as the ultimate act of service to humanity, but it doesn't exactly say, my blood pays a penalty for your sins. 